thank you very much for, to all of you here at TMU for welcoming us, for engaging us, for challenging us, for posing very pointed questions, but also for sharing your very personal uh, stories and your circumstances. It really helps inform uh, great policy making. Uh, in terms of what we've been discussing, fundamentally what Canadians need to understand is that our government believes that all people should benefit from the opportunities that this country provides. Canada needs to work for everyone. This includes providing people with a safe place to call home. And safety definitely came up in our conversations today. We know we are in a housing crisis, a crisis of supply, a crisis of affordability. I see it in my riding of Parkdale High Park, which is just a few blocks west of us here in Toronto, and we see it right across the country. And it is being felt most acutely among renters. This is indisputable. We know that rent is expensive, and we know that apartments can be hard to find, especially here in Toronto, but across this country. There are challenges facing renters. There are bad landlords. There are large rent increases. There are rent evictions. How do tenants protect themselves legally? This is a question I ask myself as Minister of Justice. This is a question that we ask ourselves as government. Tenants need help to navigate the legal system and to understand their rights. That is fundamental. Knowledge is power. That is why today I'm very pleased that our government is announcing a new fund, which will be called the Tenant Protection Fund. This, thank you. <laughs> Feel free to apply. <laughs> but, but what's important about a fund is how much funds are inc included within it. This will be a $15 million fund that will give legal aid services to tenants and to tenant advocacy organizations so that they can better protect tenants against the risks they face in this very tough rental environment. All people deserve access to the legal system, particularly when they are at their most vulnerable. I cannot imagine a more vulnerable moment facing than facing eviction or already living in a tent city because your rent has doubled or tripled. That is a tragic and terrifying place to be and it is not right that it is happening right now in this city and in many cities from coast to coast to coast. This new tenant protection fund is an important step toward creating more equitable and more affordable housing for people in our communities. It is just one more way that our government is taking steps to ensure that we represent and take action to protect vulnerable people and put the housing needs of Canadian residents first. For further elaboration on what we are doing in terms of housing, I want to turn now to Minister Sean Fraser, my colleague, and the Minister of Housing. Thank you, Sean. Uh, thanks very much uh, to, to my colleagues, but most important to everyone who allowed us to share a, uh, an important conversation today. I think building this perspective of the people we're hoping to serve uh, into the decisions that we make is essential if we're going to end up making good decisions. You know, there's millions of Canadians who rent in this country, and they are feeling the impacts of the housing crisis as much as anyone. Uh, the conversations that I've had, not just today, but over the course of the last number of months, really demonstrate the human impact behind the challenges that people are facing when it comes to finding a place to live that they can actually afford. Uh, when I think about uh, the life circumstances of somebody who's been displaced from the place that they, uh, they rent, I think about people who are close to me, uh, who've just had their fourth kid, who've been told that their rent's going up $1,200 a month. Uh, when they're an artist and somebody who helps uh, repairing roofs, they can't afford a $1,200 a month increase. And they've been told that they have to move their entire family to a new place to live. When I think about people who are moving to a new community to seek a professional opportunity for themselves, to start their career perhaps, uh, there's a lot of people who are making decisions about what job they're going to take or what city they're going to live in based on their ability to find an apartment that they can actually rent. When they can't find a place, it doesn't just impact that person. It impacts the entire community who misses out on the talents that they want to contribute. When I think about students that I talk to across Canada, including those here today, I hear stories about people who are making choices as between living close to campus and potentially unsafe or overcrowded residences because that's all they can afford, or living a couple hours away from campus where they're missing out on the opportunity to focus on their studies or build relationships that could last a lifetime. We don't have to accept that this is always going to be the case. When we adopt new policies that build more rental housing, that actually reduce the price pressures that people are facing, we can change the life experience for an entire generation of young people in this country and people who rent no matter what age they are. 
Over the course of the last number of months, we've been advancing policies at a heightened pace to help address some of these concerns. In order to build more homes, we're doing what we can to actually make the math work for the people who build them. We've removed the GST from apartment construction. We've got new low-cost financing programs that are stepping up the pace of home building and expanding eligibility to include student residences to make sure we're building the kind of homes that are targeting populations who are uh, facing significant, significant need. We've invested to change the way that cities build homes by increasing density near the services, opportunities, and infrastructure that already exist. And we continue to focus on measures that are going to support some of the most vulnerable, including billions of dollars of investment directly in the construction of affordable housing. But we also know we need to do more to make it easier to rent and to buy a home in this country. Earlier today, the Prime Minister announced three specific measures, including the new Tenant Protection Fund that Minister Varani just shared. But there's two additional measures that I want to share with you uh, more formally today. Uh, the first is that we're moving forward with a renter's bill of rights. We know that this isn't something the federal government can do on their own, but we are going to launch a process beginning with consultations this summer that's going to bring provinces and territories and other stakeholders to the table to identify the solutions that we can put in place that will ensure everyone has a floor under them when it comes to the treatment they should be entitled to as a renter. The kinds of areas that we will target with the Bill of Rights include cracking down on rent evictions. It includes sharing the pricing history for the apartment that you're seeking to rent. And we will work towards a standardized lease that ensures bare minimum protections that everyone in Canada should be entitled to when they rent. The final piece that I'm very excited about because it could change the game for a generation of young people who currently don't see an opportunity for themselves to one day own a home is changing the rules around how we calculate rent history when it comes to establishing credit. There are a lot of people in this country who rent who would like to buy a home, but they can't because they don't have credit, or maybe even have bad credit, despite the fact that they have never missed a rent payment for years. We can change this because right now the impact on people is that individuals and families who can actually afford the monthly payment for a mortgage are being denied that opportunity at home ownership. I don't think that's right, and I think we can change it. By amending the Canadian Mortgage Charter, and advancing open banking, we're actually going to create an opportunity for consumers to have their rental history calculated into their credit score, which will enable financial institutions to have a full picture that will establish their credit worthiness. If you pay your rent on time every month, that should count for something. And we want to make it count to make it easier for people to own a home in this country. I want to say thank you for the opportunity to engage. This conversation will stick with me for many months after we leave the room today. And I want to say we're going to continue to advance measures over the next number of weeks and months that make it easier to afford a place to live. And I don't think that's too much for Canadians to ask for. Thank you. Merci tout le monde. I am so much shorter than you, Sean. Oh my gosh, I'm just trying to get this mic to where it needs to be. Uh, can we open it up? Any questions? from our friends at the back or in the room. Oh, yep, so thanks I so much, Matt. I think this is, yeah, okay. I can hand this off. Um, so if you can just state your name uh, and outlet and one question, one follow-up, and go down the line. Hey, uh, this is for Minister Fraser. Uh, Aiden from the Trillium here. Um, so just looking to get an update on the uh, national housing strategy spat between you and the province right now. Uh, I just kind of want to know where things stand. You sent the letter March 21st. Calandra responded, he was talking to reporters today saying that he is not going to budge. There is a Monday deadline, I believe, so like, what, what is going to happen? You only have a few days to respond to that. Uh, so maybe just by way of background for people who may not have been following the story. So we entered into an agreement uh, worth billions of dollars a number of years ago with the government of Ontario and other governments uh, right across the country uh, to do a number of things, uh, including building more affordable housing. Uh, when it comes to the agreement that we've secured with Ontario, the provincial government has agreed to build almost 20,000 uh, affordable housing units uh, with the support of the federal government through the agreement that you cited. Uh, there's $357 million that currently hang in balance. Uh, and of the almost 20,000 uh, target, the initial action plan that we received from the provincial government uh, had the uh, government of Ontario only achieving about 6% of that total target. Uh, after the exchange of letters that you've referred to, they've submitted a supplementary plan that has increased from 6 to 28 percent. Uh, so far, uh, typically governments across Canada have uh, achieved about two-thirds of the total target. Uh, I don't think it's responsible for me to transfer funding uh, for the purpose of home building for homes that are never going to be built. 
Uh, we are going to work to find a way to make sure that the money that we have budgeted for affordable housing in Ontario helps build affordable housing in Ontario. What we're trying to discern over the next few days as we approach the deadline before that funding lapses is whether we're going to be able to do it with the government of Ontario as a partner or whether the federal government's have to, going to have to do it on its own. So just to be abundantly clear, the 28% that you said the province came back is not good enough. If that is still the case come Monday, you will withhold funding? If there is not a clear path for the government of Ontario to satisfy the entirety of the commitment that they had agreed to with eyes wide open, then they should not expect to receive the full amount of money. Uh, we are going to finalize our assessment of their plan over the next couple of days, uh, but we are going to look for ways to ensure that every penny of the federal investment in affordable housing, housing continues to build affordable housing in this province. Uh, hey, Victoria Gibson, Toronto Star. Um, so with this announcement on rent payments towards credit scores, uh, does your government intend to put this into legislation or implement any kind of enforcement to make sure that happens? Uh, so there's two things that we're doing today and a third uh, residual opportunity to enforce should it be necessary. Uh, the first that we're going to do is amend the Canadian Mortgage Charter that was uh, put forward in the fall economic statement, which gives the Canadian public uh, a, a list of measures that they should be entitled to when they deal with their financial institutions. Uh, the second portion of it is to advance our work on open banking or consumer directed finance, if you wish, that will allow people to more easily and automatically share information about their rental history if they choose with credit bureaus, which could have an automatic impact of increasing their credit score if they have a clean rental history. Uh, should these measures not prove uh, to be successful, uh, the Minister of Finance has the residual authority to put regulations in place to make it happen, uh, but my expectation, given the market opportunity for people to get a full picture of a person's credit history, is that particularly with the work on consumer-directed finance and the public awareness through the mortgage charter, uh, that it may not be necessary, but should it be necessary, uh, we're going to look for opportunities to regulate where appropriate. And your government is saying this disclosure of past rental prices charged for a unit is meant to ensure that tenants have the ability to fairly bargain for a unit. Um, in the GTA right now, for example, the vacancy rate that CMHC reported this morning is less than 2%. Mm -hmm. Do you think that tenants do have any sort of bargaining power in this kind of market, even mm -hmm. if they know what their predecessor was charged? Uh, there's a number of factors that go into the uh, power imbalance in, uh, in negotiations. Uh, vacancy rates are certainly one of them. Uh, a 2% vacancy rate is not a healthy vacancy rate. Uh, over time, uh, with the various supports we've put in place, including direct funding of affordable housing construction, the Housing Accelerator Fund contribution of nearly half a billion dollars uh, just to the City of Toronto alone, and the many billions we've invested directly in the construction through the Apartment Construction Loan Program for purpose-built rentals, uh, we believe that we can actually restore a, a healthier vacancy rate uh, when this will certainly make a difference. But even with a 2% vacancy rate, when you have transparency in pricing, it uh, provides an opportunity for the entire market to realize when somebody's charging a usury fee and saying, hey, that's not fair. I'm going to look for somebody else who is charging something more reasonable compared to what value this particular unit demonstrated before. So I do believe it'll have an impact, but when we build enough supply in the market, uh, it will have a, a more significant impact when you increase not only supply, but transparency in the negotiations as well. Hey, uh, Marco Vigliotti, iPolitics. This might be a better question for Minister Varani. That $15 million for the Tenant Protection Fund, you said it's going to go to provincial legal aid organizations, but it seems like, you know, in, in Ontario, and sorry, I'm not familiar with other jurisdictions, there's a massive backlog at the LTB, the Landlord-Tenant Board. I think it's something like 50,000 cases, a recent report pegged it at. Will this really have any impact on kind of addressing, addressing some of these issues around tenant protections if there's such a massive backlog? And obviously, the federal government can't be in a position where you're appointing provincial adjudicators to this board. So uh, it's a fair comment, and what I would say to you is look at the track record of other sort of federal policies that empower uh, access to justice in terms of sort of rights-affirming initiatives, and what I'm referring to here specifically is something called the Court Challenges Program. That's a program that's uh, very rare in the Western world where we actually fund through government taxpayer dollars people that are bringing court challenges under the charter to challenge government legislation to try and improve that legislation and vindicate their charter rights. I think that model could be successfully applied here. It will be an applications-based model. It's available for individuals, but also for organizations. You may have heard Minister Fraser talk about earlier today, we had a meeting with ACORN, uh, and that uh, tenants' rights organization uh, exists in chapters right around this country. They've been at the forefront of tenant advocacy in this country for literally decades. By empowering groups like ACORN, should they put in an application, should they receive funding, what we're hoping is that that will help to distill 
a more rights-based model and rights-affirming model that is distilled through the court process. That's one process through tribunals or through courts. There's obviously other processes such as the conversations we're having here today with Ryerson students and with ACORN generally on policy making. We believe that if we address this from multiple fronts, that it'll help to ensure that the rights of tenants are at the forefront of the battle for better housing and more affordable housing and more rights-affirming housing in Canada. Thanks, and uh, Minister Fraser, just uh, one question for you. Um, considering, you know, what we're seeing here, I know housing is generally seen as a shared responsibility, although some of these issues around renters' rights have typically or historically been something that's exclusively been in the provincial purview. By the fact that, you know, um, that this is a major theme going into the budget, is it fair to kind of frame this as a, maybe the federal government sending notes to the provinces that you guys haven't stepped up enough to, to, to do enough to protect renters and we're having to kind of, you know, enter into this area that's traditionally been your uh, kind of purview? Uh, look, one of the things that I, I draw upon when I'm trying to figure out uh, what's our role in solving a crisis that people come to our office uh, searching for solutions for is my experience as a local member of parliament. Uh, when somebody who doesn't have access to the health care uh, they need comes to my office because there's a shortage of doctors or a backlog of appointments, it's cold comfort for them to uh, hear from me, that's not my jurisdiction, go knock on the door of your provincial representative. They, they don't want to hear that, they want to hear how I'm going to help. Uh, sometimes that means I pick up the phone and call the local provincial member. Other times it means I direct them towards federal funding opportunities, depending on the nature of the specific concern, uh, that may actually help solve the challenge, even though it may be a different level of government who holds the keys. Uh, there are certain things that we can do that are squarely within federal jurisdiction, and we are doing them. Uh, look at the waiver of the GST on new apartment construction. Look at the low-cost financing program we're putting in place through CMHC to build thousands upon thousands of new apartments in this country. Uh, look at the different measures we're putting in place to restore the role of the federal government in building affordable housing. Uh, but we also know we need other levels of government to do more. No one level of government. Forget whose responsibility it is from a technical point of view. We all know this is a problem. Uh, no one level of government can solve it alone. And in fact, we need the nonprofit sector and the private builders at the table too. Uh, what we're trying to do today is to help people. Uh, my sense is there's different attitudes towards different housing policies with different governments of different partisan persuasions. I do think sincerely most actually do want to help people. The signal that we're trying to send today is not to bully another level of government into getting their house in order. I wish all would do more. Uh, it's to help people who are calling us desperately saying, life is too expensive. We think you can do something to help. By putting a renter's bill of rights on the table, people see an opportunity for themselves to seek recourse. Even though it may technically be provincial jurisdiction, federal leadership can help inspire action. When people don't have access to a credit score that allows them to pay a mortgage, when they know they can make the monthly payments because they're already paying more in rent than a mortgage would cost, they just want somebody to help solve that problem and we can do that by actually working with financial institutions, credit bureaus, and yes, sometimes provincial governments. When it looks to people who are having trouble navigating the landlord-tenant system in their given province, uh, sometimes it's extremely complicated and a little bit of money on the table for advocacy organizations may come from the federal government, but it's going to help them navigate provincial uh, uh, systems. Uh, when we actually say, um, when we change the conversation away from whose technical responsibility is this and starting ask, asking ourselves instead, how can we help the person in front of me, uh, we're going to come to a better place uh, seven days a week. That concludes the Q&A period. Okay, thanks so much everyone. Thank you so much.